that the Word of God, it was written about 2,000 years ago. And some of them were uh, much, much uh, longer before. But it can give guide for our today and even future. When you think about it, which is quite amazing, this ancient book can guide you. This ancient book can describe your today. And this book can show you the future. So when Jesus, he was asked by the disciples, and disciples asked him, what is going to be like the day when you return? What is, what is going to be like the day of judgment? What is going to be like? So what they were asking was clearly in the future. Then what was the answer of Jesus? Instead of he trying to describe what the future is like, he was actually taking their attention back to the history. And that day will be like the days of Noah. That day will be like the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. Why is that? Because of God is saying yesterday and today and the future. Okay, there's a big clue. God is saying yesterday, today and the future. So if you want to know the God of future, because you can travel back. How was the God of ancient? How was God in that old history? That we have an incredible gift from God, that is Bible. Bible contains so much of verified, you know, just uh, act of God and the nature of God. And that's the benefit of Bible. So, through that Bible, you would know your today. Are you with me? And you'll be able to see the, what your future holds. In fact, Bible is the book that contains the absolute finish line and what's happening even in the eternity later. There's no other book that can show. And, and that's the book that's been tested over thousands of years and still connecting, still ticking that the Bible is true. Bible is true. Okay? So the Hebrew people, they look for this moment. What is this moment? This, is this moment like David facing Goliath? There's a pattern. Everything in the Bible, it's a pattern for your life. You know, when something is happening, is that like the moment that, like Samson was uh, uh, tempted by Delilah? Is that the moment that am I actually uh, uh, tempted in the wilderness like Jesus? You've got to see what is actually going on in your life. What is this moment in the Bible? But then you'll be able to understand what kind of circumstance you are in. And you will know what are the different uh, consequences. Okay, so today I'm going to take you to a, a group of people who experience God in an incredible way. Okay, so <clears throat> why there's three generations, I put it as a title, there's, there's a three generation that I want to talk about. The first generation is the generation that were born as a slave in Egypt. Okay, and they encounter God in a mighty way. And they escape Egypt and going through wilderness. And I will introduce the first generation, people of God, as the rebellious generation. <clears throat> so if you look at your Bible, to the Numbers, Numbers chapter 14, it describes about this first generation from the uh, Egypt to the Promised Land. So it goes like this in verse 1. And so all the congregation lifted uh, up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. Why they were, why they are crying? You know, if I give a little bit of background, in a chapter before, you know, Moses sent 12 the, the spies to the promised land, land of Canaan. What happened? Ten of them came back and saying, yeah, that land is good. But we have a problem in Houston. What is the problem? The problem is there, there are giants. Not only few those, you know, giants and also the average, you know, just the height of the uh, people are much bigger than us. And they have the fortified, you know, walls and the fortress and everything. They have trained armies and what were they? 
when they look at themselves. They are just a bunch of uh, slaves escaped from Egypt. None of them have a formal military training. So we are like grasshoppers to them. So that was their report. We will all get killed if we try to take over. So when they hear that word, despite of you know, Joshua and Caleb, cried out, we can do this. God is on our side. We can do this. But the people chose to believe. Ten people, ten spies report. And because of that, they cry. They lift up their voices. It's like a funeral house. They cry and the people wept. Not for 30 minutes, not for an hour. As a whole group hysteria, they cry all night. How many of you have been in a place that uh, either in an airplane or you're in a, a house in China State and a little baby next door or it can be your own baby crying all night. Is that a fun experience? No matter how much you love your own baby, how cute they are and stuff, it doesn't matter if you cannot sleep at night at all because they are crying. So we're not talking about an hour or two. I'm talking about the all night. All the congregation, they cry, lifting their voice high up and crying. Why? Because they are so fearful of what that enemy uh, look like. Okay? Uh, let me tell you something very important. That whatever you fear the most in your life, they will have absolute control over your life. Let me repeat it again. Whatever you fear the most in your heart, that factor or that thing or that person will have control over your life. Okay? The fear is a very important thing. And when you get a chance, you actually, even right now, you ask the Lord, you search your heart, you ask yourself, what do I fear the most? That will have power and control over your life. Are you with me? And the uh, Israelites, when they saw, when they report, uh, when they received that report, they had such a fear in comparison. These taller people, giants, you know, land is good, God promised this and that, but they choose to believe that they are nobody, they are grasshopper, they are bunch of slaves. They choose to believe that the uh, land of Canaan they are filled with the uh, trained uh, soldiers, giants, they are stronger than me. Okay? What's the problem with this picture? They have already forgotten the power of God that demonstrated in the most powerful kingdom on the earth, that's Egypt. Ten plague, God for, did anything that the people of God do to help God to bring down the ten plague? No, nothing. All they had to do is just sitting there, just watch. And uh, when God says, you know, apply the blood, and that's all they did. And they escaped. And how did they escape out of the land of the boundary of Egypt? Through the ocean. The ocean was opened up. Can you imagine? We're not talking about somebody who's just having a faith issue in their life. I'm talking about people as a whole congregation. They have experienced the incredible power of God. In Egypt, outside of Egypt, in the desert. And at the end, at the report of that there's some giants and there's some people stronger, taller, and they are crying all night. Are you with me? That this is the problem. No matter how many miracles that God may have performed in your life, if you choose to believe, your enemy is still bigger than what God has done and who God is, you know what, your situation is no different than these uh, first generation, okay? So what happens when you don't have faith in God, but you have more faith in circumstance and your enemy is stronger and all that, what comes out of your mouth? 
In verse 2, it says, All the children of Israel, they complain against Moses. Why Moses? Because God is invisible. And God's been speaking through whom? Moses. So, uh, you cannot grab someone, you know, who you cannot see and touch. But Moses, they can see. Moses, they can grab. So they grab Moses. And they complain to Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness. Talking about group hysteria, being suicidal. There's all these people, they say, you know, it would have been better that we all dead in Egypt. It would have been better for us all dead in the wilderness. I mean, can you imagine the, uh, the stress of Moses? You know, sometimes just uh, four people getting out of the house. How many of you know that just your family alone, just getting out of your house is a mission? Mom, where's my shoes? Mom, this and mom, that or dead. You know, I can't. It, it's such a mission to take four people to somewhere, but the millions of people Moses had to lead and guide, and on top of that, all night crying and complaining. I strongly feel for Moses. All right, but God takes an offense because God says. Moses, they're not complaining to you. They are actually complaining to me. They are not rebellious to you, Moses, God says. And they are rebellious toward me. Okay? And uh, this rebellious generation, the first generation, and they are known as a complaining generation. When you don't have faith in God, when you fix your eyes upon the circumstance or the people or the, your enemies and all that, what comes out of mouth easily, so easily, is that the excuses and the complaining and the complaining and complaining. And we need to search our heart. Because are you going to be one of those, uh, uh, I believe, one of the three generations you will see yourself. You search yourself. What comes out of your mouth? Toward the Lord, or toward the circumstance, toward the uh, church, or toward the pastor, or toward yourself, and whatever things, your authority figures, and you just watch your way that what you talk about. Okay? And the verse 3 And why has the Lord brought us uh, to this land to fall by the sword that our wives and the children should become victims? And would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, let us select a, a leader and return to Egypt. So who was the leader at the, uh, up until that point? Moses. Moses. How? Because God appointed them. So Moses led them up until that point. And the democracy people, the congregation, they just gathered up. You know what? Our de uh, decision is that the Moses wanted to go where? He wanted to go to promised land, but that we had to change our mind. We, our new destination, new coordination is that the, we're going to go to Egypt. Clearly, Moses, he's head, heading toward a different direction. So that means we need a new leader. Let's pick one leader who's going to take us to, back to where we came from. Okay? And that's that. In the sight of God, what is that act? It wasn't just... Uh, our burst of frustration for the one woman. I'm talking about all night long, crying, wailing, and at the end, their conclusion is that the letter select the leader and return to Egypt. It's called rebellion. It's a rebellion. Okay? How did that rebellion come about? It started from the fear of their enemy, a fear of their environment and situation, unbelief. It is the issue of unbelief. They could not, did not believe what God has done in Egypt and what God's been doing in the uh, uh, a barren place called wilderness. How God's been providing everything despite of the pillar of, uh, of fire, despite of the pillar of cloud, that still despite of the provision of manas and everything, and they could not see the hand of God, what they concluded in their heart. You know what? It's better my 
non-Christian days. Oh, I know some of you. If I didn't receive that gospel track, if I didn't say, Jesus, I'll accept you as my Lord and Savior, if I only didn't pray that prayer, I would have been partying now. I would have been doing this, and I would have been doing that, and doing that. Because when the life gets hard, as a believer, when you have constant enemy, constant difficulty in your life, yes, it is a real thing. Perhaps something like that happened to uh, 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 one of the apostles, meant to be our apostle, Judas. I wish I can go back. You know, be careful. Be careful what you wish for. What happened to this first generation? What, what did they wish? We wish we were dead in Egypt. We wish we were dead in this wilderness. Thank you, your wish has been granted. They all did in the wilderness. They set out to enter into the promised land. That was all of their hope, including some Egyptians. But none of them <coughs> made it. Why? Because they couldn't see in the time of testing, in the time of difficulty, because they put their eyes off from the Lord who had performed <coughs> incredible things. You need to remember what kind of miracles and what kind of things that God has done in your life to pull you out of the wall. And how much of grace of God has been in your life. Provision. It may not be the uh, uh, incredible level of blessing. Maybe the, the daily uh, provisions. And some of them, you have incredible uh, the sense of God's you know, provision and all that. But don't forget the provisions, the miracle of God to pull you out of the hole. And uh, He is with you. Okay? So, look at the first generation. Some of you may feel like, you know what? That may be me. Okay? I'm close. So what happened? That first generation is all dead, except Joshua and Caleb. There's a new generation, next generation, generation that were under 20, when they left the, uh, Egypt, and uh, many of them, they were born in the middle of a uh, wilderness. They may not even remember what was like, uh, the life in uh, Egypt. And that's the next generation, I would say, I call that obedient generation. This is incredible uh, people. Of God, you know. If you ask me, you know, what kind of people you would like to have in the Bible? So, what kind of people will be the a perfect, or well, not perfect, you know, just uh, you would like to you prefer as your congregation? And I'll say, well, this is the Joshua generation. Look at this. This is the uh, Joshua chapter one, and it says, after Moses dead, and. Um, Joshua finally gave his order, yeah, we're going to do this, we're going to cross the river Jordan, we're going to take the lane and this and that. And this is the response. Compare this to their father generation. Okay? This is the, um, the word, verse 16. It says, so they answered to Joshua. There's a bunch of people. They said to Joshua, saying, all that you commanded us, what did they say? We will do. Wow, what a sweet sound it is. As a, any of the leader, they, he gave any instruction. The first response was what? We will do. I have an objection, sir. No, it cannot be done because of this and that. Here's the response. We will do and whatever you and wherever you send us, we will go. We'll do and we'll go. What a sweet sound it is. Wow. And verse 17, what was the um, uh, difference, these people? Just as we heed Moses in all things, so we will heed you. We will listen to you. And only the Lord, your God, be with you as he was with Moses. Okay. And um, verse 18, it says, Whoever rebels against your command and does not heed your words, wow, in all that you commanded him shall be put to death. Only be strong and of good courage. 
This is not the word of God to Joshua. This is actually congregation. They were speaking back to Joshua. Okay? So what do you see this generation different from the previous generation? And they had fear. But it is not the fear of the giant. It is not the fear of circumstance. It is that they have fear of God. How did they learn this fear of God? This is the generation that were in the wilderness mainly. They are youth. They spend time in the wilderness, not in the Egypt. So what did they see in the wilderness? Faithlessness of their fathers. And the constant complaint, constant disobedience to the Lord of their fathers. What happened to them? One way or the other, they all perished in the wilderness. You know what they learned? Yes, giants there. Yes, lack of water is hot. Lack of food may be difficult. Having the same clothes all year round, in next year round, and 30, 40 years, that's not fun. But what is the most fearful thing? Disobeying God. That is the most fearful thing. You know, at one point, in their friends and the, some tribes, you know, the ground opened it up, swallowed them up, because they were uh, rebellious uh, toward the Lord. And they have seen firsthand what holy God could do to the uh, unpleasant of uh, people of the Lord, disobeying after all that power of God has been displayed. So they had, what is their fear factor, number one? It's God. What was the word of God? What of Jesus said to his disciples? Do not fear the man who can only destroy your body, but fear the one who can destroy your body and also your soul in eternity in hell. Fear him. Okay? Do you have a fear of God in your life? You better have. Because it is the key thing that we can get ourselves in line with the act that God wants us to have. Okay? So they have faith in the Lord and they have fear of God in their heart. So one of the things that we see is that they are ready to take the land filled with the giants and the people stronger than them and they have better technology of war. Why they have this overcoming spirit? Because they have seen how their forefathers, their you know, previous generation, what did they do? They, why did they cry all night? Because they, they were just about to cross over to the promised land. But the moment they hear that the enemy is stronger and, and uh, uh, numerous in number, they wanted to go back. In other words, they were cowardly. You know what, in your Christian world, let me tell you something very important and very, uh, perhaps you all know. After you become Christian, does enemy leave you alone? Oh, now he's Christian. Oh, she's a Christian now. I better run. And enemy just disappears so that you have a peace until you die. No, in fact, just because of you become a Christian now, enemy is more angry. Enemy is more jealous. So you will put all sort of things around you so that you will give up on your faith. There is going to be enemy because of your call by God. There is going to be a, a, a fight in front of you. Holy battle. What are you going to do? This younger generation, they've learned how their father generation chicken out. And the result, they all dead in the middle of nowhere. Not in Egypt, not in promised land. And they learned there's no turning back. There's no Stepping backward. That means I will go in. The one thing difference is that the, uh, this generation and the generation before. And uh, when they left Egypt, did they have to fight any of the uh, Egyptian army? No. Who fought for them? It was Almighty God. But what happened when they were coming into the Promised Land? What did they have to do? Did God cross the uh, the <coughs> There's the walls of Jericho and killed everybody in it. Watch careful. This is the Bible quest. How did they enter into it? Yes, God did bring the miracle. 
bring down the uh, walls of Jericho. But still, the people of Israel, what did they have to do? They had to grab a sword, get into it, and have a combat. They had to wipe them out. Surely, it's not an even fight because they were under the shock, you know, crushed by the rocks and all that. And nonetheless, they were still alive. Israelites, they had to fight. And in the rest of the campaign, did God bring down uh, all these humongous hail and kill all the enemies? No. They had to go into the hand uh, fight, you know, combat with the sword. In your Christian war, you, God allowed, God just uh, 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 this enemy so that you have to fight for your destiny. You have to fight for your promised land. Amen? Don't be a, a coward. Oh, God will fight for me. God will do everything for me. I'll just sit down and watch that until everything is done. Yes, some parts that He will do. He pull you out of the wall. But what God wants you to do is that God wants you to grow up. Be a man, spiritually speaking. Don't change your gender. Okay? Be the one who actually entering in and fight for your destiny. Fight for your inheritance in the Lord. Amen? This is the generation. They have the spirit of overcomers. You know, it is no mistake. The seven churches in the book of Revelation, Jesus said, For those who overcome, and I'll give you this, and I'll give you that. Salvation, you get it for free. Amen? Do you know that? Salvation, you get it for free. But for your reward in heaven, you have to fight for it. Are you willing to fight for your uh, inheritance in eternity? Yes, you bet. You've got to fight for the reward that God has for you. Okay? For those who are ready to fight, they were able to enter in. And uh, what's amazing is that these people, what they were saying is now they are speaking the word of God. Who said this word to Joshua? Only be strong and of good courage. It is not the people they spoke to Joshua first. Who spoke that word to Joshua first? It was God. Be strong and courageous. Because I will be with you. When this congregation, either they heard the voice of God, either they somehow they are in touch with God and they speak the word of God instead of complaining. Okay? In a church, there's some small group of people, always, I believe, some people are like this sort of generation, this kind of spirit they have. They always have fear of God instead of fear of man. They always have spirit that we can do this, we can totally do this. There's a two people as an exception, even though they are older, they belong to the first generation. Who are those two people? It's the Joshua himself and Caleb. We can totally do this. In fact, Caleb, when he enters, you know, he was a really, really grandpa. But he said, I will take the high place. I will take, because he had this spirit. It is no regard about your age. You can be a strong young man in your spirit, regardless of your physical age. In fact, I have met so many teenagers in their spirit. They think and act like a really grandpa. Oh, oh, pastor, why can I do that? Oh, too difficult to me. Are you kidding me? And I've met some mission field, uh, in the mission field, some of the people in their 80s, going into 90s. I can do this all day long, serving the Lord, sharing the gospel, risking my life. I was born for this. Some of the grandpas, amazing grandpas and grandmas. Serving the Lord. But some of the teenagers, even in their 20s, they say, Oh, I got this, that, you know. What if this goes wrong? What if I hurt my toe? You know, if someone, you know, reject my gospel sharing. You know, it's going to hurt me. It's going to give me a sense of rejection. I need to counseling this. and uh, Get over it. Yeah. Be the Joshua generation. If the Lord is with you, 
Who can be against you? Pick your heart up. We need to be strong. Speak the word of God instead of your whatever the uh, just excuses and uh, complaints. And um, one more generation. Are you ready? The third generation is the ignorant generation. That generation is the uh, at the Joshua's generation is gone. So now the book of Judges. Judges chapter 2 and verse 10. When all that generation, I'm talking about the Joshua generation, you know, that, you know, people who enter into the, uh, the, the promised land, killing them all in the fight, the battle, victorious and all that, that generation had been gathered to their fathers. It's another expression of their old day. Okay? And another generation, now this generation, where they were born, were they born in the wilderness? Were they born in the Egypt? No, they are born in the promised land. They are born and then another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord, nor the works which He had done for Israel. Pay attention to this. I want you to uh, look at the word. The, another generation who did not know the Lord or His works. Does that mean that they did not, somehow, this Joshua, Joshua generation, they forgot to tell their children how God was marvelous in Egypt and wilderness, even in the fighting the war with the Canaanites in uh, the promised land? I bet they did. I bet, like a broken record, you know, some of the old people, they speak their, you know, the younger days, like the same and same ways, and whenever I talk about certain things, and, you know, my kid, children, they go, Oh, here we go again, you know, then he's talking about these old days and this and that. But listen to this. I don't think it is just that they did not know the effect. You know, you got to look at the uh, word, the know. Is that it's not just information knowing. It's about experience. It's a Hebrew word for yada, which means you experience. Man and woman getting married, having the first night together, that's the word yada. You experience all uh, understanding of God. You know God in your head because you're born in a Christian family. Because you, as, as far as you can remember, you've been, you've been going to church all your life. So you, got all, you may even get the, uh, you know, all these prizes from the uh, uh, Bible quiz or different things. Because you know all that in your head. But in your heart, in your own life. You don't have much of knowing of God or His own Word. This is another very dangerous thing. Especially the children of, you know, Christian, good Christian parents. Thinking that, oh, you know, I know Christianity. Because when I get out there, share the gospel, talking to some of the people, you know what, don't talk to me, don't preach at me. I've been there, done that. How? Did you actually ask Jesus to come into your life and rely on the power of the Holy Spirit? And make... No, 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 I tried church. I tried this and I tried that. They would think that I know Christianity because I went to church. I went to the Bible camp and this and that. You may know stuff in your head, but you do not know. There's a very good possibility that you do not know God through your own life and through your own experience. And uh, that's the spiritually ignorant generation. And I see that clearly now in New Zealand. There once New Zealand used to be the country that every corner there's a church and that church was a, a, a pet with the people. Generation, they experienced the power of God, anointing of the Holy Spirit. There's so much so that people wanted to pitch a tent in a field to worship the Lord. Cry out to God and pray all night. And that's how this church came about. But what happened to their next generation? And one after. Somehow they just figured, you know, I grew up in a church. I know a thing or two. But in my heart, I don't really know who God is. That is the 
ignorant generation. Not because of lack of knowledge, but because of the lack of experience with the Lord. Because they did not experience the Lord through their own lives. What was their life is like? Verse 11, Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. That's what happens. Even though you're a pastor's kid, even though you're elder's kid, you are, you know, so-and-so's kid, if you do not encounter God personally, experientially, what happened at the end? You will serve somebody else. Period. It's not just abnormal thing in that particular generation. Every generation is the same. If you do not encounter God for your own sake, there's a good chance somebody else claim your life. That's what happened to this, you know, one right after the Joshua generation. Faithless generation. And the verse 12, and they forsook the Lord. God of their fathers and who had brought them out of land of Egypt and they follow other gods and among the gods of the people who were all around them and they bow down to them and they provoke the Lord to anger. Let me summarize this. What happens is that the, when you come out of Egypt, when you come out of the world, as you're heading toward the promised land, and if you check it out, if you fearful of the enemy, you will not enter. Okay? And if you are uh, courageous, and if you are filled with the fear of the Lord, overcoming spirit, you will enter. And that's the young obedient generation. But what happens then, even though you were born in the promised land, the surrounding is so wonderful, great Christian uh, environment, grew up in a church and everything, but if you do not connect your soul to personally Almighty God, what happens? Your life will provoke you angry toward the Lord. And eventually what happens to those that are kicked out of promised land? They're causing all this thing. That enemy actually you are inviting. Your disobedience to the Lord will invite. Book of Judges, you know, will fill with that. Inviting enemies into your life. Then you cried out to God. Then God delivered them. Okay? Some of your actions and our actions can actually invite enemy to come into your life. When you are serving someone or something more than God. What do you call that? Idolatry. When you are worshipping someone or something more than God. Even if you are born in a Christian family, in you know, a great environment and all that, that doesn't help. You gotta have your own faith. Otherwise, ignore generation. And um, I'm gonna conclude this word this way. And I believe in this church and wherever you are, there are a mixture of these three different generations. Some of them are so fearful, constantly complaining, constantly, you know, rebellious toward the Lord or, or whatever. And, but also there are some people that are like the spirit of Joshua and Caleb. Totally we can do this. They actually speak the word of God. Whether they knowing me or not knowing me, doesn't matter. They speak the word of God to the leaders. And they say, we will do it. And we will go. Just tell me, we will do Okay? And they will take the victory, they will take the inheritance. But also there are some generations that are just so complacent. Because, oh, I know a thing or two about Christian trials. My mom's great, wonderful. <coughs> when they talk about their mom and dad's legacy of their spirituality, they're just so happy to talk about it. But when it comes to their own, do you have any testimony how the Lord had worked in your life? They didn't have much. Sure enough, they have idols. They love certain things more than God. And eventually, even great King Solomon was swayed away by all this, you know, women. Because he loved those women more than God. He became an idol worshiper. I want to challenge you. Wherever you are, 
you got to search your heart, turn things around. Okay, what does this picture look like? What is this you know, farmer doing? It's a plowing. Why do you plow the ground? Huh? Because uh, when you keep on planting without uh, telling the, um, uh, the ground, you get all the nutrients from the top. Okay, so that there's not much of nutrients, so that harvest is not the great. So the farmers, you know, he, everywhere in the world, they, you know, just uh, every year, they just, before they, you know, uh, uh, sowing the seed, they till the uh, whole uh, uh, soil upside down. It's a, it's a plowing. And the same thing, you know, I believe that is the Rema word of God for all of us. Even if you consider yourself as the obedient generation, you know, they're not perfect. What was the promise of uh, the problem of the Joshua generation? Sometimes they knowingly, sometimes without knowingly, they made a uh, compromise, little compromise with the, some, of, some of the inhabitants of the uh, Canaanites. And later on, it, it become a, a, a stumbling block for the generations to come. The little bit of a compromise, it will result in an issue much more uh, later years. So this is the word of God to uh, Israel, it says, I said, plant the good seed of righteousness, and you will harvest a crop of love. Plow up the hard ground of your heart. Some of your hearts. It becomes so solid, so in a negative way, so hard, that nothing will grow, nothing will be able to uh, lay roots. You need to plow the ground of your heart. Now is the time to seek the Lord, that He may come, shower you with righteousness upon you. I want to just challenge you. And if you consider yourself as that I'm more fearful of circumstance and the enemies, rather than trusting the Lord, I'm the young, um, that generation, that the rebellious one, complaining one, you know what? You need to plow your ground of your heart. And even if you are the obedient, it's just uh, whatever you consider that, yeah, I, I think I'm more like number two. Still, that uh, generation had a problem of the compromising in little things, sometimes unknowing. We can still uh, make it better. And if you're that ignorant generation, you have a lot of knowledge, but you don't have any experience with the Lord, any testimony with the Lord. And at the end, you have a huge idol in your life. You love something else more than you love. You know what? You need to turn around. Otherwise, enemy, you are inviting enemy into the promised land of your life. You are at the danger of that. Unless you turn. Unless you plow the ground. <coughs> Amen? So I want you to just close your eyes right now. And I'm going to invite you into the front that... Uh, Regardless of your condition of your soil, of your heart, whether you see yourself as an even obedient generation, or the rebellious one, or the ignorant one, whatever that is, when you sense that the Holy Spirit was speaking something to you, why don't you come to the front? And I'm going to pray that the God will turn things around of your heart. Because if there's a promise of God, the time will come that God will pour His showers of righteousness upon you. But the problem is that though we don't like to change. We don't like to allow God to come and plow the lane of your heart. It takes humility. So please come to the front for the people, whatever the condition of your heart, that Lord, and I want the, the plow of God, and I, I want God to turn Till the ground of my heart so that I can be soft, so that I can be uh, teachable, so that I can be uh, able to uh, harvest the fruit of God in my life. I'm going to ask you one, one last time that uh, you've got to search your heart. Am I, uh, do I have the tendency of complaining and focusing on the oldest? Uh, enemy 
in the environment more than God, then you have a problem. For you, uh, unless you're careful, that we're gonna be just uh, not able to the full destiny that God has for us. We shouldn't look bad. Don't look bad. Press forward. Perhaps you're born in a family that is so Christian everything. Amazing testimony of your moms and dads. But you don't have any. And in fact you are uh, uh, attracted to that is not a God. So you're serving it. You are inviting enemy into your life. Plow the ground of your life. So that God can shower you with the incredible blessing and the joy of the Lord. Right? Father God, I just pray that you would search our hearts and you will work the ground of our heart. If there's any of us whose heart is like that rebellious heart of the first generation, and I pray that they will turn our heart soft. And you will take away our fear. But instead, we will have faith in the Lord. And also, for I bless the one that our obedient generation, they've learned the lesson, they've seen the consequences of rebellious generation, and they are eager to do whatever the Lord has for them. Lord, I pray that you bless them. And let them actually conquer and uh, possess the land that you had promised for them. And also I pray for the ignorant generation. Lord, I beg you, have mercy on them. And you will encounter them. If, even if it is necessary that they have to go through some difficulty in life, it is better to encounter God. So I pray that you will create a situation, they will cry out to God, and they will have their own testimony. So it is no longer their father's God, their mother's God, but it's going to be their own God. And Lord, we invite you that you will do something in that next generation, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We are your people. Word in our hearts. In Jesus' mighty name.